as, as part of the revised uh, audio section of the Radio Technology Museum, we thought it would be important to take a look at transducer technology. Now, a transducer is the part that makes the electrical audio frequency energy into sound that you can hear. And of course, this all starts with the telephone, uh, well before radio. And magnets in here move a diaphragm, and sure enough, you can hear things. Now, uh, of course, telephone operators needed to do this, and they didn't have enough hands. This leads to the invention of the head telephone, or headset. And this gets used in early radio, and, but you want to have more than one person to listen, listen to this. I mean, two people can go this way, uh, but that really doesn't solve the problem. So, horns of this sort were invented. You put your headset down here, and like so, and voila, you have a loudspeaking telephone. Not real efficient, not real good sounding, but better than, better than a headset. So the next step in our journey here is the formalized horn speaker. You have an headphone element in the bass here, talks into the horn. The horn does an acoustic transformation from high pressure down here to low pressure over a large area over here, thus projecting the sound out in the air where you can hear it. And we'll play this one. Now, the main shortcoming in all of these horns is lack of low frequency response. And also because of the uh, headphone element, you can't drive these very loud until, until they distort. So that's your basic horn speaker. We all, we've seen them all on the radios, uh, et cetera. That got us on into the 1920s. Okay, and the next piece of equipment we're gonna take a look at is this horn. Now, we had a gentleman named Peter Jensen, a Swede. He worked for Vladimir Polson on the Polson Arc radio transmitters and found himself in California working on the transmitters for the Federal Telegraph Company back in the teens. And he gets involved in audio, in particular sound reinforcement, public address. And so he takes a look at these loudspeaking telephones and he develops a better one. Instead of a magnet pulling on a diaphragm, he has a metal diaphragm in here with a voice coil on it like a modern speaker. And one of the shortcomings of the headphone drivers is that the magnet technology was not very good, the permanent magnet technology. So Jensen, installs a big electromagnet to provide the field for this speaker. You run it off the A battery in your radio, pulls about a half an amp at six volts. And so now we've got a strong magnet, we've got a real diaphragm with a voice coil, and it's capable of being pretty loud. Now, Jensen's original company and original trademark was Magnavox. So, that's a good loud horn speaker. You still won't have any low frequency response to speak of. Meanwhile, back at the telephone company, 
uh, they're working away on talking pictures, public address, making their telephones loud so people can hear them. And they take the next step and develop the paper cone loudspeaker. And so you have a big paper cone here. Inside you have a horseshoe magnet with a device called a balanced armature driver. Armature moves this way and a push rod comes out and moves the speaker. The primary advantage here is that because you have a much larger speaker, a much larger cone, you can reproduce lower frequencies and get better reproduction of sound and music. Of course, the paper cone speakers are fragile. Your kids or your pets could tear them up pretty, pretty readily. So what really happens is devices like this RCA speaker, cone, metal frame to protect it, and still a balanced armature driver with a horseshoe magnet back here to move it. Uh, a lot of these were built. Uh, those RCA speakers you see in the little boxes are of this sort. I think it's RCA Type 100. You're still crippled by the fact that the magnets really aren't strong enough. Okay, the next stop in our journey to audio excellence here is the RCA Model 104 loudspeaker. Uh, this was developed about 1925 uh, by a pair of General Electric engineers named Rice and Kellogg. I don't think it has anything to do with Rice Krispies. So, up in front here, you have a paper cone in a metal frame, much like the Model 100, except this time the cone has a voice coil on it, much the way the, much the, way the Magnavox did, and the magnet structure is an electromagnet much like the Magnavox. So you have the advantage of high efficiency and high output, plus the better low frequency response of the paper cone. Uh, because you need to power the magnet, and because you need some amplifier power to do this, this thing contains a type 10 amplifier tube, a couple of rectifiers and a voltage regulator, and would also serve as an AB, an AB battery eliminator for uh, some of the radiola radios. But uh, we'll turn this around and we'll, we'll play it for you. Okay, so this is the electrodynamic loudspeaker, like you find in all the 1930s radios. Big field coil that's part of the power supply and a large cone speaker that sounds pretty good. And we'll play this guy. So, again, the phone company comes into the picture. They're working away on talking pictures, uh, sound for the movies. And what they come up with is two-way speaker systems, the woofer and the tweeter, and their tweeters are horns. The so-called multi-sectoral horn that you see has multiple openings to it. And they get involved with James B. Lansing, who establishes a company called Alltech, short for All Technologies. And he manufactures equipment essentially designed by the phone company. And in 1944, he introduces the Alltech duplex speaker. This is a 15-inch speaker. And in the middle of the speaker, right back through the voice coil and everything, there is a multi-sectoral horn that does the high frequencies. Uh, this device is genuinely high fidelity. 
in fact, they get used for studio monitors and recording studios for many years thereafter. Uh, this one happens to be co cobbled into a Jensen speaker cabinet, and we'll play the thing. <laughs> Okay, and let me take let me take one second to cut over to some material that's not an acoustic recording. <laughs>